G'day everyone and welcome to topic 8 for Laws 11062 Contracts B. Topic 8, the end is starting to draw nigh. My name is Anthony Marinek and this week we're going to be talking about frustration of contracts. So this is the second uh, week that we're spending looking at methods of termination of contracts. And we're slowly getting into the more murky side of termination. So last week we were looking at termination by agreement. And obviously there's no problem between the parties there. We're also looking at termination uh, by uh, completion of the contractual obligation. So termination by performance. And obviously if the contract's being performed, well, there's no problem between the parties there. This week we're looking at a situation where the contract hasn't worked out. The contract hasn't worked out the way that either of the parties intended. But having said that, there's really no moral responsibility upon each party uh, to take any responsibility for the fact that the contract hasn't worked out. Let's have a look at frustration. What are we going to look at this week? We'll start by looking at what frustration means within the context of contract law because I'm sure that as law students you're all familiar with what frustration means within the general meaning of the word. We'll have a look at different categories of frustration and we'll learn how to tell the really tricky stuff which is the difference between something which looks like frustration and something which appears similar to frustration but which doesn't have the same legal effect. Finally, we'll look at the remedies and outcomes which the court will apply when the court is confronted with a frustrated contract. Our starting point for frustration is a case called Cadelpha Constructions and the State Rail Authority of New South Wales. Now this is a, uh, a High Court case which was handed down in 1982. It's reported in volume 149 of the Commonwealth Law Reports, commencing on page 337. Having said that, the fact that Cadelpha is a 1982 case shouldn't mislead you into believing that the doctrine of frustration started in the common law in 1982. It certainly didn't. And as we go through the lecture today, and as you go through the notes on your own, uh, you will certainly notice that many of the cases that are being referred to in those notes are much earlier than 1982. So why do we refer to Cadelpha then? Well, we refer to Cadelpha because when the High Court heard this case, the opportunity was taken to walk through the doctrine of frustration as it applies to contract law and set it out authoritatively for Australia in a way that really is quite neat and easy to understand. So Cadelpha provides um, a, a, essentially a summary of the doctrine of frustration as it applied to that point. So for those uh, of us who are looking at frustration in the period since 1982, Cadelpha is a great place to do it. So what happened in Cadelpha and the State Rail Authority, because so far I've been talking about this idea of frustration, but haven't really explained it. Let's have a go through Cadelpha. Cadelpha was undertaking excavation work. Okay, so the State Rail Authority was extending rail lines and needed some excavating done, and they hired Cadelpha to do it. Now, the contract said that the excavating had to be completed by a particular date. And both sides knew that it was going to be tough to meet that date. Both sides knew that it was going to require round-the-clock work six days a week. So in other words, three eight-hour shifts, 24-7, for six days a week. So 24-6, I guess you could say. If there were going to be delays... Those delays were almost certainly going to result in the uh, timelines not being met. So, work got underway. The only problem with excavation, particularly excavation right around the clock, is that uh, excavation makes a lot of noise. And excavation 
can become a public nuisance. And in this particular case, local communities got upset about the amount of noise that was being made in the course of this excavation. And so local community members sought and obtained an injunction. The injunction was to the effect that Cadelpha was not going to be able to continue working around the clock. Now, of course, uh, neither Cadelpha nor the State Rail Authority were particularly surprised by the fact that community members were going to get upset. They knew that that was likely to happen. And what they did uh, before they signed the contract was obtained legal advice about the likelihood of one of these injunctions being obtained by community members. And what they were told by their legal advisers essentially was that this was not going to happen. They were reassured that an injunction was most unlikely. So they had actually contemplated whether an injunction of this type might occur and they'd received what they felt was good advice saying, no, nah, not going to happen. But then, of course, it did. So the question is, what should happen to the contract? Because Cadelpha is now absolutely not, under any circumstances, going to be able to complete its requirements under the contract. It's not going to happen. Because you can't spend less time on the job and somehow still hope to meet the original performance deadlines, particularly when those performance deadlines had relied upon three shifts a day for six days a week. So it wasn't due to any lack of diligence on Cadelpha's part that they weren't going to be able to meet the timeline. It wasn't as though they had planned poorly. It wasn't even as though they had taken any legal risks. I mean, they had obtained advice which they ought to have been able to rely on, and this advice said, go for it, there's not going to be an injunction. In the same way, the State Rail Authority of New South Wales hadn't done anything wrong. I mean, they were trying to get the job done as quickly as they could, which seems like a pretty reasonable thing for them to do. And they too had been involved in obtaining legal advice and that legal advice had said, there's no problem here. The injunction is not going to happen. The High Court had a look at this and decided in the end that the circumstances of this contract were frustrated and they set out a definition. The definition says that frustration occurs whenever the law recognises that without the fault of either party, a contractual obligation has become incapable of being performed because the circumstances in which performance is called for would render it a thing radically different from that which was undertaken by the contract. Let's unpack that. First thing we've got to note is it's without fault of either party. If either party has done anything to bring about the frustrating circumstance, well, they're not going to be able to then rely upon that frustrating circumstance to end the contract without disadvantage to themselves. Second thing is that an obligation has to be incapable of being performed. Now, as we'll see when we get further into the, uh, um, into the lecture, incapable of being performed means actually incapable of being performed. It doesn't mean that it becomes more difficult or more expensive or more complicated or anything like that. It means actually incapable. And the reason that it has to be incapable of being performed is because the circumstances have rendered performance radically different. Radically different. So something in the circumstances has changed so much that what we thought we were talking about when we made our contract is no longer there. The circumstances for the contract to work are gone. Those are our three criteria. Now, everything else that we talk about for the rest of this lecture are really just an application of those three criteria. So keep them in mind as we go through each of these. Ask yourself, is there fault? Is the obligation incapable of being performed? And is the reason that it's incapable of being performed because something has rendered performance 
radically different from what it was at the outset. Let's start by looking now at some classes of frustration. These are some common types of frustration, but in a way I kind of hesitate. In, in, in a small way I hesitate to introduce these classes of frustration. I have to teach them to you because everyone who learns about frustration in contract law learns about these categories. They're also useful to help you understand a bit more about what we're actually talking about with frustration, but they do come with a danger. And the danger is that you might walk away from this lecture thinking that these are the only categories of frustration. That is absolutely not the case. Absolutely not the case. These are just some common examples which seem to meet the criteria. The fundamental question which the court will ask in any matter of these types is not, and the fundamental question that you should ask if you're doing problem questions, is not, does the circumstance fall into one of these categories? The only question worth asking is, do the free rules in Cadelpha apply to this situation? So please understand that. Once you're sure you understand that, let's have a look at some examples. The first one is destruction of the subject matter. Now, the famous case that we talk about for destruction of the subject matter is Taylor and Caldwell. Now, this is an 1863 case, so you can see straight away this is 120 years before Cadelpha, so clearly Cadelpha didn't make up the law in this area. Uh, it's an 1863 case. It was reported in volume 122 of the English reports, commencing on page 309. Now, Caldwell leased a music hall to Taylor so that Taylor could uh, uh, run a performance. However, the music hall then burned down. Now, of course, once a music hall is burned down, it's not much use anymore for holding concerts in. And by the same token, it's not going to be possible under most circumstances to provide another music hall. So provided that neither party was responsible for burning the music hall down, you can see that this contract is frustrated. The Cadelpha elements have met. No fault on the part of either party. Performance of the contractual obligation is now impossible. And it's impossible because the circumstances have made the thing radically different. There's a radical difference between a music hall and a smoking hole in the ground. So destruction of the subject matter will often meet the Cadelpha criteria for frustration, but not always. For instance, let's say that I, I was a food contractor and I made a contract to deliver a load of ice cream for a children's party. And on the way to deliver that ice cream, there was a problem with my truck and the ice cream melted. Now, that's the destruction of the subject matter. Absolutely it is. Does it frustrate the contract? No, it does not, because the ice cream is essentially a commodity. And I can go back to wherever I purchased that ice cream from and I can purchase more. And if my truck's not going to be capable of delivering it to the party, well, I can hire another truck. So you can see in that circumstance, there is no fault. The subject matter has been destroyed, but it hasn't made it impossible to complete the contractual obligation. And it hasn't rendered the contractual obligation somehow different from what it was when it was envisaged by the parties. So you can see there's a great difference. Just because the subject matter has been destroyed doesn't mean we've automatically got frustration. The question is, is the effect of that frustration to meet the three requirements in Cadelpha? Let's apply the same sort of logic to the death or incapacitation of the party, of a party. And the case here is Morgan and Mansa. Now this is a 1948 case reported in volume one of the King's Bench reports for that year, commencing on page 184. Now, of course, 1948 
tells us that uh, any cases around that era are likely to have had something to do with the Second World War, which, of course, swept up every aspect of England in the early to mid-1940s. And this one's no exception. Mansa was, uh, he was called up. He was called up by, uh, for conscription in the British forces, which most um, men of age, uh, of appropriate age, were called up um, during the Second World War. And uh, as a result, he was not able to complete his obligations um, to his agent, Morgan, who he had hired to sort of secure uh, performance work for him. He was a, a, a performance artist. And um, the court found that this was frustrated, this contract was frustrated, because... Certainly neither of the two parties had caused the war. Neither of the two parties had caused Mansa to be called up. That was something that happened as a matter of public policy. Him being called up did make it impossible for him to complete his obligations under the contract because as a serving military member in time of war, he, he was not free to move around and go wherever he pleased and give, contracts, uh, give concerts wherever he pleased. And finally, the circumstances of his call-up changed things radically from what had been understood. When, when they had initially made the contract, he was a free agent who was entitled to go around and do whatever he liked. That was no longer the case by the time the contract was frustrated. So you can see there the incapacitation of the party by being no longer able to perform his duties frustrated the contract. It's also easy to see how the death of a party might frustrate a contract. But the death of a party is not, or incapacitation of a party is not always going to incapacitate the contract. Let's say, for instance, that you have a contract with a plumber, and the plumber has three apprentices, and the work that um, is uh, going to be done is within the capacity of an apprentice. On the day before the plumber himself is supposed to come and do your work, he dies. Is the contract frustrated? Well, arguably, I would say no. Because although the plumber as a party is not going to be able to complete the work, one of the apprentices could come and do it. This is a different situation to Morgan and Mansa, isn't it? Because it's not as though Mansa could just send somebody else to go and give performances on his behalf. The whole idea was to have him giving the performances. Now, that doesn't always work if you're talking about a situation where somebody else can be easily sent in substitution. In the same way, the death of a party doesn't always incapacitate them. Now, that sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? If you're dead, you're pretty well incapacitated. But from a legal perspective, that's not so. Particularly, this is the case where the obligation involves giving up either money or property. So if you're selling an item and you've received payment for it and then you die, well, it's still possible for that item to be transferred. It's just that it would be transferred by the executors of your estate. In the same way, if you had a debt to somebody, one of the first things that your executors are going to be required to do in the execution of your will, is pay out that debt. So when they're paying out that debt, they're effectively acting on your behalf. So you're acting in a legal sense, even though you're no longer alive. So death and incapacitation can be frustrating, but they need not be. Again, the only way to know for sure is to apply that Cadelpha definition. Next example. Failure of the basis of the contract. Now, this is this is uh, brings us to cases that everyone remembers. Everyone remembers this case called Crell and Henry. Crell and Henry is a case from 1903. It's in, reported in the second volume of Qu of King's Bench cases for that year, commencing on page 740. King Edward the Seventh was to be um, crowned king. And uh, 
Henry decided that he wanted to see the coronation parade. And so he found out the route that the parade was going to take and he organised to hire the balcony. The balcony of a flat which overlooked the, uh, the, the route. So he was going to be able to be up high. He would get a great view of all the marching troops and of all of the uh, carriages and the, the new king and all of the other nobles as they made their way along the coronation procession. Now when he hired this balcony, both parties knew that the reason the balcony was being hired was so that he could see the coronation parade. So it was fundamental to the contract that the purpose was not just to hire a balcony. The purpose was to hire a balcony in order to see the coronation parade. Now, of course, then the worst happened. The new king fell ill and the coronation parade was cancelled. Henry said to Krell, well, I guess that means our contract won't go ahead because there's no real need for it now because I don't really want to hire a balcony in order to watch an empty street or watch the traffic go by. If there's no coronation, there's really no contract. Krell, of course, didn't see it quite that way. He said, well, no, hang on, we've got a contract here. You've agreed to pay me quite a bit of money in order to hire my balcony. I'm still absolutely prepared to give you the use of the balcony on that day and I'm going to insist that you meet your contractual obligation. The court, of course, didn't go for this at all. The court said that an absolute basis of the contract was that the balcony was not being hired out as a balcony. It was being hired out as a vantage point from which to see the coronation parade. If it was suddenly no longer a vantage point from which to see the coronation parade, then there was no point at all in continuing with the contract. Let's think about that in Cadelpha terms. Was either of the two parties responsible for the problem? Well, no. I can't see that either of them had anything to do with the king getting sick or the coronation parade uh, getting cancelled. Did it make performance of the contractual obligation impossible? Well, yes. If the contractual obligation was to provide a vantage point for the coronation parade, that became impossible as soon as there was no coronation parade. Was there something that radically changed the nature of the obligations from the time that the contract was made? Well, yes, clearly there was, because there's a radical difference between a balcony which is a vantage point for the coronation parade and a balcony which is just a balcony. So, we can see that the elements of Cadelpha are met. That becomes a uh, that becomes a frustrating event. Now, you've got to be careful about how far this goes, though, don't you? See, what if I made a hotel booking, and I made the hotel booking. Because I, with, a, uh, with a, a room on the side of the hotel that would allow me to have a sea view. And I did this in the hopes of taking some beautiful photographs of seascapes from that high vantage point in the hotel. And I didn't particularly tell them about this. And I arrived for my three night stay and for those whole three nights... The weather was just disgusting. All I could really see out the uh, window was murky pea soup. Now, from one perspective, that's not really so different to Krell and Henry, is it? Because I'd really been after that room as a vantage point for my photography, and it turned out not to be a vantage point for my photography. In reality, though, the hopes of taking those photographs were just that. They were just hopes. They were an expectation. We can't allow the Krell and Henry situation to become an excuse for people trying to say that, that contracts are frustrated just because they didn't get what they hoped out of it. Let's take a more obvious example. A young, beautiful, single lady 
is on her way to a ball, a charity ball, and she buys a particular dress, and she buys this particular dress because she thinks it is going to attract a lot of attention and make her the absolute belle of the ball. And when she's buying the dress, she tells the people in the dress shop that she really wants to look like the belle of the ball. And they assure her that she looks wonderful. She puts on the dress and she goes to the ball and nobody looks at her twice. Now, if she was just buying a dress, then of course nothing is frustrated. You would say that the contract has been discharged by performance. She got her dress. But if what she was buying, if what she was buying was the ability to be the belle of the ball, if the reason for the contract, the reason for the dress was in order to be the belle of the ball, then couldn't we say that that was frustrated as a result of the outcome? Well, no. Realistically, we can't. Realistically, that's not a sensible argument to make because the mere fact that she hoped that the dress would turn her into the belle of the ball uh, is not something that is a, the basis of a contract. It's not a significant underlying factor. So you can see the difference between the two. You really don't want to press the Krell and Henry situation very hard. If you find that you're dealing with a um, problem question in an exam or a problem question uh, in a tutorial question, hint, hint, you really need to think very carefully. Is this actually a Krell and Henry situation or is this just that the um, the party participating in the contract had a particular hope and that hope turned out to be in vain. I'll leave you to think about that uh, as you um, go through and deal with problem questions. There's some more examples of frustration though. The next one is delay. Now delay is, is really quite complicated and we'll come back to it um, shortly when we're talking about things that are not frustration. The only way to deal with delay is to go straight back to our Cadelpha definition. First question we'll ask is, did either of the parties cause the delay? Because if either of the parties caused the delay, then uh, clearly it's not going to be frustration. Second thing is, does it make the obligation actually incapable of being performed? Now normally, a delay won't. Normally a delay will just means that the, mean that the obligation gets performed later. But sometimes a delay will make it impossible to perform the, delay, uh, the, the um, obligation if there's a very clear reason why the obligation has to be performed within a certain time frame. Alternatively, delay could render the performance of, of uh, an obligation radically different. For instance, if you made a contract to say take somebody uh, on a beachside holiday and initially the contract was to take them on the beachside holiday in April when um, summer is just starting to turn to autumn and the weather is still very pleasant, but you delay the trip until July and you take them on a seaside um, holiday which is absolutely freezing and where they don't want to walk out um, outside the heated uh, apartment, let alone go down onto the beach, well, you can see that that delay may well have rendered performance radically different. We're talking about a contract which turns out to be completely different to the one we'd initially signed up to. So we have to ask those Cadelpha questions in relation to delay. The next example is impossibility. Now, Incapable of being performed is one of our fundamental Cadelpha definitions. So anything that's impossible is almost certainly going to uh, meet that part of the Cadelpha definition. The thing is, impossible has to be impossible. And we, we ran into this concept already in Contracts A when we talked about uh, the issue of force majeure. Impossible doesn't just mean difficult. Impossible doesn't just mean expensive. Impossible means impossible. You actually can't do it. If something is just inconvenient, problematic, too bad. You still have to meet your contractual obligations.
Finally, there's what we call supervening illegality. Now, we've already learned, just in the last few weeks, we've already learned that an illegal contract, a contract which would involve um, either an offence, a criminal offence, or something that is either expressly or impliedly prohibited by statute, those contracts are void. They're vitiated by the illegality. So why are we talking about illegality in terms of frustration then? Well, let me explain. What happens in a situation where a contract is perfectly lawful at the time the contract is made, but then it suddenly becomes unlawful by the time the contract is to be delivered? So nobody's made an illegal contract because the contract was A-OK at the time it was made. But some of the obligations then can't actually be undertaken unless the party is prepared to break the law. It's pretty fair for the party to say, I don't want to break the law. And so as a result, what the law is quite likely to say is, well, this contract is frustrated. It's frustrated by the supervening illegality. It's frustrated because something which a contract which was not illegal at its outset would be illegal um, to complete. So let's now look at some things which are not frustration. And the reason we do this is because quite often students want to jump in and find frustration even where uh, there really is no frustration and they get themselves into all sorts of trouble by doing it. And uh, unfortunately, um, uh, examiners like myself can be quite sneaky about these things and we can set up problem questions that are really designed to look rather like frustration but they turn out not to be. So why don't we look at, at, at how we tell the difference. Again, though, we go back constantly to our Cadelpha definition. That's where all this is going to come from. All of these circumstances which are not frustration, well, they're not frustration because they fail to meet one of the Cadelpha definitions. We'll start with inconvenience. Now, we've just dealt with this a little bit. If something is inconvenient, if it's harder, if it's more expensive, but it's not radically different, well, it doesn't meet those Cadelpha definitions, does it? because it's not impossible to perform and it's not radically different from the initial um, obligation. The example that we use here is Cooper and Sons and Nielsen and Maxwell. Now this is a 1919 case uh, from Victoria and it's reported in the Victorian law reports of that year, commencing on page 66. Now this is a contract for delivery of steel Delivery of steel to the dockside in Melbourne. The company supplying the steel was a British company and they'd planned to source the steel from Germany. 1919 tells us that we're in the shadows of the Great War from 1914 to 1918. And what happened in this particular case was that uh, before the contract could be delivered upon, the First World War broke out. Germany, of course, was an enemy nation in the First World War, and there were uh, sanctions against um, sanctions against having economic dealings with Germany. And frankly, I suspect that at that time, Germany probably would have found other things to do with its steel resources than sell them in any event. So, obviously, as a result, Cooper and Sons um, were uh, were um, unable to supply the steel bars. In fact, I'm not sure offhand whether Cooper and Sons were the appellants or the plaintiffs. In any event, the British company was unable to supply the steel bars which they planned to get from Germany. Thing is, of course, that the Germans have never been the only manufacturers of steel bars, and it was perfectly possible for those steel bars to be uh, obtained elsewhere and supplied to Melbourne. They mightn't have been able to do it at the same level of profit. They mightn't have been able to do it on time, and so there might have been some damages that needed to be paid. But fundamentally, there was no reason that this contract couldn't be completed. It was just inconvenient. Tough. It's not frustrated. Regardless of how inconvenient it is, 
the party has to complete their obligation. Next one takes us straight back to, uh, to Contracts A when we talked about force majeure. Now, the force majeure clause is one obvious way in which a contract can deal with events which would otherwise be frustrating. It may also be that there are specifically identifiable risks which a contract might pick up and identify how the parties plan to handle the circumstances in which that risk came to pass. If the contract does so, if the contract sets out how certain events are going to be dealt with between the parties, the doctrine of frustration will not intervene. Remember our basic philosophy here, what the court wants to do as much as it can is implement contracts and support contracting parties in their contractual activities. So if the parties, when designing their contract, have taken steps to make sure that they were able to deal with frustrating events, well, the court has no intention at all of stepping in between those parties and interposing the doctrine of frustration to the advantage or disadvantage of either. The third circumstance, which is often not frustration, is delay. We've already talked about this at length, and I won't go through it again at length, there's certainly more explanation of it in the lecture notes. Remember, it's all about Cadell Farm. The question is, does the delay make it impossible to complete the contractual obligations? Or does it just make it less convenient, more expensive? Finally, we get to self-induced frustration. Now, again, this goes straight back to that Cadell for definition because for an event to be frustrating, it has to be without default by either party. Question is, what does that mean? I mean, if the frustration arrives as a result of a risk and the parties could have done something, potentially, to avoid that risk, well then, can we say that the risk is, is, is simply happenstance. I mean, is a party under an obligation to try and do things to prevent a risk from coming to pass? Surely they are. Surely they are under some level of obligation to do things to guard the contract against risks. But by the same token, surely that obligation only goes so far. Now, if we think about um, if we think about our burning musical hall, for instance, which uh, we, we talked about earlier in the contract, uh, in the lecture when we talked about Taylor and Caldwell. Now, if clearly if one of the parties had lit the fire, if the party that owned the music hall had lit the fire, well, that would be self-induced uh, frustration and, and um, would not assist them. I think... That's not particularly difficult to get one's head around. However, did the music hall owner have a duty, for instance, to make sure that there was firefighting equipment available in the music hall so that if a fire broke out, it could be fought and would not result in the destruction of the music hall? Well... Perhaps that would be a good idea, but it's pretty harsh, don't you think, to suggest that they are um, somehow responsible for the fire because they didn't have firefighting equipment available to protect, to prevent uh, the fire from spreading. So you can see how it's always going to be possible to look at a frustrating event and say to one party or another, look, here is something that you might have done which might have prevented the frustrating event from occurring. What the doctrine of self-induced frustration tells us is it's got to, you've got to do better than that. There has to be a genuine level of moral and practical responsibility associated with um, the alleged failing. A genuine level of moral and practical responsibility. If it's really quite artificial, if we're constructing something to find some level of duty of care, that's not likely to be self-induced frustration. 
that's going to be the real thing. So what happens when frustration occurs? Well, the first question we have to ask is, has there been a total failure of consideration? A total failure of consideration is not just something that is exhibited by every 16-year-old boy or girl towards their parents. A total failure of consideration in contract law occurs when one party or another has completely failed to deliver any real aspect of their legal obligation. So in other words, one of the parties has ultimately not delivered on any of their consideration whatsoever. One party has done nothing. If that is the case, if there has been a total failure of consideration, well then, the other party, the party which has completed some of their obligation, they will be able to obtain what's called restitution. Okay, so they'll be able to obtain um, the repayment, in particular, of any monies which they have paid to the other party. So, if we take our uh, Krell and Henry situation, for example, that's a good, that's a good example. Let's say that, that uh, Henry had paid a deposit of £50 in order to secure the balcony. And then there's a, a total failure of consideration as a result of the, uh, uh, the cancellation of the coronation because there's, there's absolutely nothing being done by Krell in relation to the provision of a vantage point uh, for seeing the coronation parade pass by, well then in that circumstance, Henry will be able to get his £50 deposit back. And the reason for this is that the law won't allow, in a situation of frustration where neither party bears any responsibility, the law is not going to allow either party to make a windfall. So the law is not going to allow either party to become unjustly enriched at the expense of the other as a result of the frustrating event. Now remember that's only the situation if there has been a total failure of consideration. If there has only been a partial failure of consideration, well the situation is going to be quite different. If there has only been a partial failure of consideration, the court's experience tells it that it's very difficult to pick apart who might owe whom and who might have become unjustly enriched at the expense of whom. So the only thing the court can do in that situation is say, look, from this point forward, in futuro, as they say, the legal obligations associated with this contract are gone. However, any obligations that have been completed to this point have been completed and they won't be undone. What this means is that the losses must lie where they fall. And what that means is that if one party has already completed most of their obligations, even if this is at quite a, a deal of expense to them, and then the contract is frustrated and there's only been a partial failure of consideration, what well, means unfortunately they will lose out. And the rationale is that often there is simply no just way, no just way to pick the parties apart. So once we've got frustration, we ask, has there been a total failure of consideration? If the answer is yes, we can go for restitution. If the answer is no, the losses will lie where they fall. Can I please caution you when you, when you come to things like... Um, problem questions in examinations. Don't be tempted to try and rush in on your white charger and make everything good and make everything just. Sometimes it is going to look to you like there has been an unjust outcome as a result of frustration where there has been a partial failure of consideration and the losses lie where they fall. Don't be tempted to correct that. It's just a great way to lose marks in an examination. So that's frustration. What have we learned in this uh, lecture? Well, we talked about the meaning of frustration and the Cadelpha definition. No fault of the parties, 
obligations can't be completed and take on a radically different character from that which was anticipated. Next fact is that the classes of frustration are not closed. Okay, the Cadelpha definition always imply, uh, applies. And we've talked about some common classes and we've talked about situations in which they are and are not frustrating. So destruction of the subject matter, death or incapacity, um, the failure of an underpinning basis to occur, that was our coronation cases, where delay makes the obligations impossible or radically different, where completion of the obligations is impossible and where there's a supervening illegality. We then looked at what the results are of um, a frustrated contract. If there's a total failure of consideration, restitution can be given. If there's only a partial failure of consideration, the contract is void from that point forward in futuro and the losses lie where they fall. Next week, well, next week we get even further into murky um, moral waters because next week we're going to look at breach of contract. Next week we're going to look at what happens when one party or the other simply does not complete their obligations under the contract. Once we've done that, we'll be in a position to spend the following two weeks having a look at the remedies which are available both at common law and under the Australian consumer law to assist parties innocent parties who have been the victim of a breach. So that's all for this week. I hope you enjoyed learning about frustration and that it wasn't too frustrating. And uh, I, I hope you have a great week. I'll look forward to talking to you about breach next week.